Welcome everybody to One Degree, a scandalous with the man over here, Kato Kalin. Hello, Tom. And I'm Tom Zenner. You picked a great day to check us out. If this is your first time, you're going to enjoy the next hour or so. We've got a fantastic guest. We're not going to waste a lot of time. We've got Rachel Yucatel. All right, world famous. Um, when you talk about a scandal, she was in one of the biggest of all time, no doubt about it. The affair with Tiger Woods. The whole blowback from that with Tiger and everything. And then Rachel has a new podcast out now called Misunderstood with Rachel. You could tell Ada was just on it. He was just on episode number 14. So we've got a lot to talk about and no holds barred. We're going to talk about everything. Yeah. You talk about Tiger Woods. Also, uh, I'm going to name drop Derek Jeter. Mm -hmm. His name will be in there. And uh, David Borean. So, you know, it's the name drops all done respectful. Yep. And if you think you know the story about Rachel, you don't. And you're about to find out. She's a, a complex, dynamic, and and, and a very impressive lady. And it's all going to come out here. So we're intelligent. All right. So, Cato, what do you say we take a quick little break and we're back? I can't wait to see her with Rachel. You could tell. All right, Cato, let's bring in our guest. Very high profile. Very excited to have her. You were just on her show recently, Rachel. Who could tell? Joining us from Florida. Am I am I right, Rachel? Florida tonight? I'm actually in New York today, but you know, I knew that. I could feel the New York vibe. I knew I had a 50% shot. It was either Florida or New York. How, how has the move so far been down to Florida? Are you still bouncing back and forth? Are you adjusting? Yeah, I'm bouncing back and forth. I am adjusting. I can't wait to get to Florida full time. I will be there full time starting at the beginning of the summer. And um, so I'm just happy to. I love New York. I'm a New Yorker, but I... I'm happy to now live in Florida. I can't deal with the cold winters, even though I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. I know that sounds weird. I should be someone who could handle cold weather, but I cannot handle it. As you can hear from my voice, yeah. I just got back here three days ago and I already am falling apart completely. So well, you suck it. warm weather. I didn't know you're Alaska and all that. I actually used to live in a guest igloo. I'm kidding, <laughs> Rachel. I, would you be but, shocked though, Rachel, if that were no, true? No, not be shocked. But you would probably be the best house guest so that he has them on. I love that. I mean, you would have had people flocking to Alaska. I would have. the K train. I would have been rubbing nose and Eskimos and, and getting sniffless. I don't know. Sniffles. <laughs> is it? What kind of show is this, Kato? I don't know, but Rachel's there. I did her show and I feel like we're friends and she's... She's just true. It, it's like it's fun when Cato makes up jokes on the fly, <laughs> right? And we're and we're the uh, the test market here. By the way, Rachel, how did it go with Cato? Was that your first extended time spending with him when when he was on your show recently? With Cato, of course. Yeah, I didn't know him before I did this, and he was fantastic. His show did so well that I mean, I texted him. It put us on the map. We became number fifteen for all entertainment news in America. So that was due to Cato's show. I think. Well, so, good job. And what he's doing. I think it's due to you. And also, I was, uh, it, you can tell when something's going really well because even on my page, I was getting comments every day, really positive comments of uh, uh, it impacted people. People felt moved by it. And I was like, wow. I, and I think it's a credit to you and, and your interview. And I, I hope that we do as good a job interviewing you today because people really, uh, they just responded in a, in a really passionate way. And I, I loved it. And uh, they, all the right moments and uh, uh, you created on that. And so, like I said, I credit you. But uh, Well, that's nice. But it's interesting when you have a story that, you know, people over time have heard already. It's sometimes nice to tell it again because, you know, not everyone has thought about it in a while. And it's so fun is probably the wrong word, but it's so interesting to reminisce on, you know, your story, my story, whatever it is, because people all do remember it at some point. They know where they were when they heard the verdict, they know, you know, all these things yeah. about interesting, no matter who the audience is and no matter when you talk to hear about your, your stuff. Yeah. And also, I think it's also because we have a, a, well, pretty much in common, we're both maligned by the, uh, the media and all that. And, uh, uh, terrible things said about me, what do you remember? And uh, see when it happened to me, it really affects you no matter what, if you could have 99 great comments, you remember the one bad one. Do you remember one comment that just was like devastating to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would get so many. I still get comments, you know, but like the one that stuck out to me was, I hope you get AIDS and die. God. That was like a crazy one. I was like, who are these people? Yeah. Who are these people? You don't think they don't have Before I had kids, they would be like, you should never be able to have kids or and get married or, you know, but just these horrible things. But these people now it's been so long that now I've learned that you know, I, I, I hope that these people that I can look at them as almost fans because they're like obsessed with writing behind a computer and writing stuff at, at me to like 
try to knock me off when a horse may think I'm on. It's like, why are you writing this stuff? It's so mean. And that person must have such issues in themselves to be able to write things like that. So now I've learned to not internalize it as much. Back then, it was really, really hard for me. I mean, it's still, listen, don't get me wrong. When I hear or read uh, uh, some negative comment, it always stings a little bit, but I have to put into, you know, context who it's coming from. Yeah, Yeah. Tom, I'll tell you proper introduction. Well, of course. I mean, you know, Rachel, we could tell is, and, you know, congratulations on the podcast, Rachel. And well, you're a couple months into it, and I can't wait to go back and listen to the episode with Kate, you know, because you two have something in common where your life really just got radically changed, courtesy of the media and the paparazzi, and and you know, and you're different from that point on. But I, I know one of the reasons you wanted to start this was maybe for a little therapeutic element for you. Um, it definitely has to keep busy, but doing a podcast isn't as easy as a lot of people think it is, especially when you're lining up guests and whatnot. But so far, a couple months into it, has it has it kind of served the purpose for you personally that you were open to get out of it? A hundred percent. So we've only aired, I think we've been airing for seven weeks now or six weeks, something like that. And um, I dropped two shows a week, actually. And everyone so far has been a guest, you know, it's uh at first, I thought that maybe I would do some stuff more on my own, which I will get to. But we've had so many people call and want to be on the show at, now that I started the show. Um, or I think to myself, oh, I'd really like to have this person. And now it's it seems pretty easy to get them because they see I have a credible show. And the topic for it, you know, the name is misunderstood. And I think it's a universal theme that a lot of people feel misunderstood, you know. So for me, it's really, you know, cathartic, I guess, to be able to interview people that I find interesting, that I think should be reconsidered or the story within, you know, that that person got famous from should be reconsidered. And I just interview these people because I have questions and I'm interested in it. And I find other people are interested in it too. And if it's not specifically guest related, like it was with Cato, um, I talk about topics that I find are interesting and people don't know that much about or want some new questions answered. So that's you know, that's the premise for the show. And I love it. I love doing it. Um, we, we've filmed at least 12 more already that we have waiting in the can to Wow. So we are, you know, and we're in the incoming phone call business about people wanting to get their story out or their topic out. So I'm really excited about it. Well, you were in front of the camera before because I don't think people realized that you work for Bloomberg News and I don't know what you, you obviously did something camera. How did that even come about uh, to work for Bloomberg? Oh, that's kind of a good story. I um, I worked for an internet company originally. I was probably 24, 25. No, sorry, I was 22 um, when I worked for this internet company. And um, I loved it. I thought it was great. But I had always wanted to be in TV. My parents had started cable television in Anchorage, Alaska. So I have that history in me um, of coming from like a, te- a television background. Sorry, it's so loud here. Don't narrate. Can you hear that? Yeah, you sound great. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. So, um, so I always wanted to be a news director, um, and I loved news. So I started dating this guy, Andy, and he worked on Wall Street. And I really, you know, I kind of idolized him. I thought he was so cool and so smart. So I wanted to get a job at a place that I could be like him almost. And um, so I called for six months, Bloomberg News. Um, I My mother had uh, known the head of TV or something and got me an interview with them. And they're like, we're not hiring right, right now. I called every week for six months. And she was so annoyed with me, this woman. And finally, one day she calls and she says, okay, we have an opening on the assignment desk, but you have to start at 5 a.m. and no complaints. And you have to just jump into it. And you can't ever be late. You can't not show up. And I was like, I'll take it. I was so excited. And I was at Bloomberg for probably four years. Um, and the person I ended up dating, Andy, you know, he, um, w- we ended up getting engaged. And, you know, I felt so proud of myself that I was like, I could have these conversations with him about business news and all that, you know, kind of thing that was his world, you know. Sure. Um, Andy ended up being the fiance who was killed. So it was kind of horrible. And I ended up leaving Bloomberg a year later um, because I... I kind of couldn't handle being at the same place where people watched me watch him die because he died in a public way. He was killed in um, 9-11 in the World Trade Center. And I was at work when that happened. And everybody, you know, on my trading floor watched watched it, me watch it happen. And we were covering it for news. So it was a really horrible experience. So a year later. 
Yeah, that is horrible. And uh, that's it. I just want to say one thing. I regret leaving because Mike Bloomberg was such a good boss, but he had a mentality that once you leave the company, you can never come back. He has a loyalty thing. So I'm still, I love Mike. I think he's great. Um, but I knew that once I left, I couldn't come back. And so, you know, it's a li- it's a bummer because I would go back in a second. I love that sure. job. That's the job I ever had. He did a hell of a job as mayor too. No question about it. New York was a different place when, when he was running the show. You know, the, the title is so apropos for you, for your podcast, Misunderstood. Have you delved into your background, because people think they know you, they think they know your story, they go by what the media's told them, right? And the media is so powerful, it can create any narrative as it wants, and it'll just steamroll you. You, What are you gonna do? Say, no, that's not true. So did you spend any time talking about your background? Because I do know a lot about it, and, and people will be blown away. You just mentioned your fiance that was killed in 9-11. People don't know that. I didn't know you were from Anchorage. That was news to me. And, and, and even your upbringing, Rachel, was so, challenging to say the least you know have you have you addressed that on your show um i have addressed it in certain ways like i did an episode on cults and i talked a lot about uh, i talked with a journalist who covered sidu my therapeutic boarding school that i went to and there was a case of a missing boy who still um hasn't been found to this day and he did a whole podcast on it um so we covered the school i went to um and we covered cults that way so i talked You know, I try to share a little bit in every podcast that I do a little bit about myself um, or I try to relate with the guest about myself in those ways. I think eventually I will do, you know, episodes here and there that have to do with just me. But, you know, I was getting into podcasting. You know, it's hard just hosting your own show and just like talking and communicating with the audience like they're there. Um, And you don't know if people are going to be interested in that or, you know, because there's no banter, right? So I have a fun. (laughs) Well, two two shows a week, that's organically going to come out, I think. You know, you'll have a guest that will relate to it in some way, and then you'll be able to talk talk about your background, how how it might, you know, coincide with what they've gone through. But, man, you mentioned cult. I mean, people are going, what what, what do you know about cult? But I mean, basically, the school you went to growing up was a cult. That's accurate, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I went to a school called Sidu in the San Bernardino Mountains in Running Springs, and um Later on, uh, I went in 1989 to 1991. I graduated from there. These these therapeutic boarding schools kind of became popular when Paris Hilton did a documentary and mentioned she had actually gone to CDU for, I'm not sure how long, a very short amount of time and then got, got sent to another sister school of it um, and didn't stay the whole time. But I actually graduated from there. Um, and so I know everything about it. Um, and later on in life, I found out that it was based on the Cyanon cult and which was news to me. I mean, when you're going through it, you don't know that you're part of a cult, you know? Um, I ran away a couple of times. I was sent to juvenile hall. Um, I, you know, could have died hitchhiking. Down. It's a mountain, you know, I could have, I could have been killed. I mean, it's crazy. I was only thir- between 13 and 16 when I went there. And uh, it was a really crazy place to be. You had to, the whole school was based on um, commitments and being in agreement, like um, following rules. So you could only wear certain t- kinds of clothes. You had to wear your hair a certain way. There was no makeup. You couldn't have, you could even flirt with somebody of the opposite sex. Um, they didn't believe in being gay for, you know, kids that would come in and had a history of thinking they were gay and they would kind of talk them out of that. And we had something called raps, which is three times a week. You would sit in a room for four hours and people would scream at you and try to bring you all the way down to your lowest point. And you weren't doing the right thing unless you started to cry and scream at the floor and work your issues out. And it was really a horrible place to be for three years. Let me tell you, you know, I had to like dig my grave with a spoon and lay in it and write an epitaph. And it was really crazy. That's crazy. Where I come from, it's called parochial school. <laughs> oh, no. But the nun's pretty rough. This is in California. It's in California now. It's been closed down because too many kids ran away. And uh, I think three kids are still missing from being there. So that's uh, a really horrible. Interesting, interesting case. People should look it up. Uh, uh, a kid named Daniel, who um, was sent by his parents from New Jersey. He only lasted 10 days. He ran away, never to be found again. And um, it's really a horrible story for parents because you you could call home. You could never... Um, tell them you were miserable, they would hang up the phone. They would always listen to the phone calls. So it was really, you know, he tried to tell his parents he was, he hated it and he wanted to come home, but he wasn't, he wasn't. Oh my home. God. That is tragic. It's so horrifying. D- did your mom know it was a cult? Did the parents go in there thinking this was a, a legit school? No. So the worst part about it, we talk about this on my podcast, is that 
you know, there's no abuse that's like physical or sexual. At least when I was there, it was not like that. It was really emotional abuse. And the worst part about it is that they kind of groomed the parents too, because they would give the parents a handbook and tell them what to um, expect from your child. Like the child's going to call and they're going to say they're miserable. They're going to say all these things. You can't believe them. You just have to say, okay, hang in there a little longer, you know? And when I was sent to the school, and this was true for many people that went there, I was given a tour. My mom said we were going just to, um, to look at it. And she left me. Like when I was on the tour, she just left me there. And they, they usually tell parents, oh, you know, your kids know that you're leaving now. It's better to separate this way. And so my mom left me there. Um, I've talked to her recently about, you know, all there's some documentaries made on the subject and podcasts. Uh, she won't listen to it. She has not, you know, she doesn't want to say anything. She's like, you loved it when you were there. I don't believe this stuff. I don't want to hear it. So I don't have a great relationship with my mother. Yeah. I'm probably stemming from that because She's I just, probably, can you imagine though, this whole school, how it's probably started out as legitimate and then they could see how they can ma manipulate the parents because I, I, did they, you think they even started as a cult going, okay, we're going to start this school and, and, uh, become a cult. I, I well, just hard they, to believe. They but... did, and I don't think, you know, it was part of Sinon was, uh, Sinanon is how you pronounce it is, um, a cult started in California by, um, addicts and it, it was a way to deal with your, um, addictions. But a lot of these kids were very young and didn't have addiction was not the issue. I had never smoked drank, done drugs, had sex. I didn't have any of that. I was just not getting along with my mother. So, she, you know, there were a lot of kids there that, yeah, some of them had some issues, but it wasn't, it, for the most part, I can diagnose all of them at this point. They just were not paid attention to. They felt neglected. They didn't know they were acting out like all 13 to 18 year olds do. And, um, you know, so it was started by the people that um, were involved with the Synanon cult. Um, and it's called CEDU, C-E-D-U. And we were all told that it meant see yourself and do something with it. But only like five years ago, I found out that that really stood for Charles E. Diedrich. It's his initials. And he was the founder of the Synanon cult. So I, I was like dumbfounded. I was like, oh my God, we've been believing all this stuff for so long. And it just wasn't true. I hope they all go to hell. Seriously. I mean, they, they had to know what they were doing is evil. And I'm sure your mom and the other parents are racked with guilt, right? There's a part of them that knows probably what was going on. They just don't want to admit to it or have to deal with it now. You know, they have yeah. if you have a kid that graduated, I recently interviewed somebody um, who told me after the interview that they sent their kids to their son to, to see do, but he ran away and he re never went back. Um, I think the parents realized after the fact that it wasn't a great school. Like I graduated, so I felt like that was my family. And I never went home again. I mean, for being 13 years old, going to a boarding school, leaving when you're 16, and then going on to another school and then college, like I've never lived at home again. So I think parents, you know, if you graduated, I think parents thought that you did well and you were wrong with your life. So, yeah. you know, not to complain about it. But um, I've learned some great skills from it, but it was also very traumatic being there. Sure. I was going to ask you how you, uh, because uh, people listen to the show, it's like how you became part of the world of celebrity. I think that you were in New York at one point, I, in, engaged uh, to maybe someone else or married. I don't know. You, you can tell me. But then you end up going to Vegas on a road trip with a girlfriend and you end up getting uh, probably the most famous uh, nightclub restaurant, uh, Tao, and running that and nothing but celebrities in, in the heyday. That's when it was really the Paris Hilton, the Lindsay Lohans, the Kardashians. It, it was just the... It was sort of the um, the best part of celebrity. I don't think it's that way anymore. How does yeah. this all happen to your life? How does it, how do you, I, from Sea-Doo C to your, your Alaska, California high school, going to uh, Bloomberg News, your story is just, it's it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's like, how does this all happen? Is it your, are your parents in the celebrity world? Uh, no, I mean, I, my dad was a big entrepreneur and my mother, you know, was kind of an actress and then went on to be a businesswoman. But no, I just am kind of, my thought was you should always reinvent yourself and you should always try and pick yourself up and, and move on. If you're not, if the path doesn't feel right, change and do another path. Like I never wanted to give up because I really didn't come from a place where I felt like I had a family, right? So I couldn't just go back home to my dad. I couldn't go home to my mother. Uh, my father died when I was 15 while I was at that boarding school, as a matter of fact. So I was, you know, I was kind of on my own. So my whole course in my life has been like, if something isn't working, you can only count on yourself. So pick yourself up and move 
you know, find another path. Okay. So what was the, my purpose, you know, what wasn't working in New York when you had to go to Vegas? Something I, something I had made you there. I had married somebody who, um, so September 11th had happened and, um, for three years, maybe after that, um, I got married to somebody I knew in high school. It was a bad decision for him and I, because we were just friends. There was no intimacy. And I just thought, you know, I want to put all my eggs in one basket. And this guy, cause he's such a great not guy. I've known him since childhood. Um, and to do, he went there too. No, no, sorry. He grew up with me in Manhattan. I, I okay. grew up in Manhattan before I went to you. Yeah. And, um, so, um, he, he basically was like an easy person for me to marry. Do you know what I mean? So I, yeah. you know, and then I think like a year in, I looked at him and I said, I want a love story. This isn't working for me. So I'm, you know, let's try 30 days apart. And I got in a car and I started driving with a girlfriend of mine. And it just so happened my old boyfriend from like my first kiss in life, this guy from when I was 12, Jason Strauss, called me and said, I'm opening a nightclub in Vegas. You're the only one I, well, he said, what are you doing? I said, I just left Steve and I'm driving cross country. I don't really know where I'm going. And he said, well, come here. I can trust you. The rest of the girls are waitresses or strippers. Maybe you could just be my right-hand person. And I ended up staying. So, and I got the most wonderful job there. It's like the most coveted job. I was the director of VIP operations for Tao, which became the number one nightclub in the world. And, you know, Jason and Noah teach such excellence in what they do. So mm -hmm. I learned from the best. And sure. I was known as the first lady in of Vegas because yep. I was a date owner. But not only that, I was running his business for him. So it was so fun. I had a, I got a lot of my credibility back doing that. Yeah. No, no, that's true power. When you when you wield that type of influence in Vegas, you know, trolling the velvet rope, essentially, at the hottest clubs, right? That's real power. By the way, we're gonna get to some of the other stuff too, and including can we talk about your book that that is on the horizon. Is that possible? Can we talk about that later? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll get to that. But we go, I mean, because people that think they know Rachel, you really don't. Um, listen to her podcast, and I'm sure she'll reveal more as, you know, every week and with every episode. But you were the, the queen of the nightlife in Vegas, right? And then you took that to do the same thing in New York. So mm -hmm. you had a legitimate big time career. You're in front of celebrities every night. You're in front of millionaires, billionaires, right? That's the world you lived in, wielding this power. Had to be a little intoxicating, right? The money, just the excitement, um, everything about it. The it was fun. I, I wouldn't call it intoxicating per se, because I always was pretty grounded as a person. I still really didn't do drugs or de I definitely didn't do drink. Um, and my job was to protect the celebrities and the big customers. So I was really, I had my wits about me the whole time. I really, I was paid to do a really good job, which I did I did not party. I wasn't like wild. And I very rarely cross lines with the people I met in terms of relationships. Once in a while it happened, uh, as we all know, but I, I, for the most part, I was really good about, you know, having boundaries because that's part, that was part of the job and I liked my job. And I loved being someone's wingman as opposed to their girlfriend. Girlfriends are expendable, but, you know, being your wingman, somebody you really trust is like where I wanted to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And you dated the owner of Taup, you said, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So how, how long did that last and did it, did it end amicably with him? Because uh, you obviously celebrities are probably hitting on you, probably asking you on dates and he probably has his pick or whatever. Was that was that the end of it or you guys just were friends said, hey, this isn't working out? No, or that actually wasn't. That wasn't the issue. Uh, I When you're in that environment, you really know what's going on, right? So I didn't care if like the hottest models were coming to the front door being like, oh, I'm here for Jason. At first it like bothered me, but I also knew that he had to have those relationships to have them come to the club, right? So, and I was just as, you know, a hot commodity as he was too. People would, you know, hit on me too. So it was more about trust and I really loved him at the time. So, um, but things went sideways, I think, because I, there was no, in my opinion, I mean, I've never really said this before, but he, I don't think he knew how to have me as the person that ran his business as Rachel, you could tell the director of VIP operations and Rachel, you could tell his girlfriend. So it, it kind of got messy there because he, you know, he wouldn't bring me to certain events because I was working. I was running the business for him. And so I would see all these pictures of him around town, having fun with all these people. And I wasn't the girl he wanted on his arm, but he, I was the girl he wanted running the business so that he could go do that and then come back. So I think 
now it, my feelings about it would be different. I wanted to be both. Um, and I think he was just, you know, Tao was the newest thing in Vegas. He was just starting it and figuring it out. Well, I, you know, if we were young and it was, yes. it was, yeah, so we're amicable. I'm mean, not like we talk every day or anything, but if I reached out to him, he would definitely respond. And, uh, and I would respond if he reached out yeah. to me. We'll let him know you did our podcast. <laughs> yeah, let him know. Hey, by the way, the statute of limitations has completely run out on this. So you can tell us a great scandalous story of some celebs in Vegas. I mean, they, they got to be great from the time you were there. I mean, if you have to change the name, go ahead. But give us something scandalous that you saw. Um, I mean, I always saw scandalous stuff. I saw celebrities who were really gay who would pretend that they weren't and come in with their gay lover and. I would hide that for them so they could have that one night with their significant other. Um, you know, that I thought was kind of a big deal. There were celebrities that didn't drink that would come in and have us pour, you know, a different drink in their vodka bottle so it looked like they drank, um, so make them look more fun or something. I'm not really sure why. There are people that were just They're super rude and super mean and should, like, literally have been canceled. Um, that said really awful things because they expected such service. And so you see a lot of that come out too, if people are really horrible people, you know. It's, so I saw a lot of that. There's very, very expensive to have bottle service because I, I know this because the only bottle service I had, Tom, was when I was a baby. That was my mother giving me a bottle. <laughs> bottle service was so different there. Bottle service, they'll, you'll it's tip though. You, yeah, no, well, I had to actually tip my mom. Anyways, but you, you, I, I'm sure, Rachel, you have a system, and I know it because I've been to these places. You have a system of how to get the bottles because the bottles have got to be at least 500, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, it, it, I'm going low probably on that, but of how you have the waitress, the cocktail waitress has to work it. I'm sure the, look, at they're trying, the cocktail waitress is trying to be their best friend. So they come back in and get the same cocktail waitress. And yeah. I, I can't, it just has to be this, I, I mean, I'm sure you saw people getting tipped. I, I, what was the biggest tip you probably had seen? And could people tip you? Because you're working, it'd be hard for you to, I'm sure you had to accept tips or- No, I, I, didn't, I didn't like to accept tips from people because I thought it took credibility away from me and would make it look like I did it for money. So I did not actually ever accept tips from people. I would tell them to tip my host, tip my security guard, tip whoever. But, and our tips were pooled, so it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got the money at the so, end of the day. Oh, it made it a little better than I wasn't taking their money. The biggest tip I ever got that I did take and give, obviously shared it with everybody. I got a, a hundred thousand dollar check from somebody who was playing poker um, or playing whatever they were playing. Came into the from the casino because it was in the Venetian. Yeah, and they gave me that, and they were like, "Here, I'm like, I'm not taking this." And he was like, "No, no, here, you obviously split it." You can split it with your sure. or whatever. <laughs> and that person was actually Paul Kemsley, who's now known as PK um, on um, the house, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Okay, that is classic. A hundred grand hundred, ship. A hundred thousand. I would have just taken, oh, this is fake and throw. Oh, no, no. You got to hold on to it in Vegas. I, and at least he did come back later and say, hey, can I ship back? I was a little drunk, <laughs> you know? The yeah, money I made there. there was so incredible because you make it all in cash. That was before the days that they taxed us. Everything was yeah, going to the yeah. I bought a home there, a gorgeous home. I bought a Porsche. I bought a Range Rover, all cash. Just walked in, picked, you know, got it. Oh, please. They, they roll out the red carpet at the car dealerships for you. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, those it wasn't just me. It was like waitresses had the same, you know, I made probably mm -hmm. more, but waitresses were doing the same thing. I saw them coming in on in Hummers and they were buying yeah. houses and stuff like that. So they definitely were doing well. Today, it's not as... You know, here's how you know how good Rachel was at her job. A gay, secretly gay celebrity goes to the hottest club in Vegas and can keep it on the down low somehow. But since that time, has that gay I'm person come out? Has that person come out already since? Because that's a while ago. Has that person uh, come out as gay now in 2023? No. no. Still, he's still at Tao with the hiding his dates. He probably doesn't go to Tao anymore because he's a little bit old. Older for that now, but yeah. he, um, he, all right, I'll, I'll have garden, you know, been like, you know, us weekly or something with a girlfriend, a famous girlfriend. Well, you know, Rachel, th this is the most that you've been able to really talk, right? In, in many, many years because of a uh, NDAs that you've had to sign, right? I mean, so this has it been freeing and has there been any blowback now that you have a high profile pot? 
podcast. Are you hearing from Tiger's camp at all? Is there any issues with that? We, when you say Tiger, yeah. Tiger, Tiger Woods, so our audience knows Tiger Woods, you had a, you dated Tiger Woods. So I haven't heard any blowback. Um, I've only heard positive things. And no, I have not heard from our camp. But I'm also very careful about, you know, the podcast is about me and letting my voice come out. I don't necessarily need to let people know details of, you know, mm -hmm. something that happened 14 years ago. But I can talk about, I do talk about what it's like to have gone through a scandal, how that affected me. So, you know, if they tried to contact me about something as stupid as that, that's just like, yeah. they need to live their life. Well, they have their own problems right now too, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did, well, how did you how did you react when you watched everything go down with his girlfriend Erica Herman, and then you know the whole backstory where you know now she's suing Tiger and the thir you know, thirty million dollar lawsuit in the NDAs? I mean, that was just a, a bizarre ending to that relationship. Did you did you follow it? Was it weird to to hear that story? Well, I was asked about it a lot, and a lot of people called me about it. Um, I you know like I'm the end all be all on what to say about. Tiger and his girlfriend. It was a little bit weird. Um, but I, listen, I know a lot about NDAs. I know a lot about that kind of stuff and why people in relationships like that do that. I think she made a mistake in the way that she's handled uh, going after whatever she wants from Tiger. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but, you know, it's very hard when you're up against a machine um, and like a Goliath of, you know, of lawyers. Um, and I don't know. We're, listen, I want to preface by saying like people that are not in those relationships just don't know what's going on. So everybody likes to be a talking head on any sort of subject that they really are not even involved in. So it's hard for me to want to make an educated like comment about it because we just have no idea. I mean, you know, maybe they had an agreement. I, I don't, you know, a verbal agreement. I doubt it. She made it seem like they had a verbal agreement for 10 years that he could live at her house as his girlfriend and he would pay her the equivalent of 30 million dollars if she left, you know, um, it wasn't that I think he was, she was trying to say that she was basing that amount on what the rent would be if she had yes. a, a like Yeah. And similar girlfriend. I mean, I, if I, if some guy and I broke up, I wouldn't go back and be like, and go call the press number one and number two, get lawyers to be like, this guy broke up with me. And now I want to go live in a 30, you know, million dollar at the equivalent of $30 million house. Like that's crazy. So yeah, I think she yeah, she was probably approached also by lawyers, and I can get you a, a great on this. Certainly, I imagine something like that happened. It was just enticing I don't her. Think that lawyers would have a hard time taking that case because they don't want to go up against uh, Tiger Woods, and sure, they also don't want to go up against what's supposed to be an arbitration because when they file publicly, like they did, that actually is breaking an agreement. So um, that's how. I'm sure that the judge will throw that part out right. and it will go back to arbitration because did, that's how they were supposed to do it. Did you ever like uh, play jokes on Tiger and sneak up behind him and fall or, or anything? <laughs> a doubt or anything? And, and but what's one of your what's one of your dates like with Tiger? Where they're all very private? Where they always was it hard to even? It it probably was really impossible to go public. Did you guys have to just meet? You know, sort of clandestine places. Uh, this is all secrecy. Well, I'm not, I don't really want to get into that stuff, but it was, it was not, uh, there was a couple of things in public, actually. I think, I don't know. I, it wasn't hidden that much, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. Oh, sure. Well, no, I said because it, was, it wasn't I, like we were pulled up in a room and we couldn't go out. I mean, one time we went and picked up Chinese food together and he actually gave the, he called in the order and he actually gave the person his name and then had me go in and get it. So I thought that was weird. I was like, okay. Um, so it was a pre delivery service. I had a car and kind of came in with me, but I went and pick it up. So anyway, it wasn't like that hit. And, and, and uh, if we can say this, and by the way, if you can't comment on stuff, I'm fine. We're fine with that kind of stuff. But you had you had high profile people you have dated. You, you've dated, uh, but Derek Jeter, I didn't know that. I, I heard you dated Derek Jeter, but New York Yankee, and probably those two, I would imagine Tiger and Jeter knew each other probably from celebrity tournaments. Uh, and um, David Boreans, an uh, actor, I think you dated him. And I, I think he lived in a guest house. That, and by the way, I started that whole guest house thing, Rachel, not David Boreans. I want you to know. Am I right about these things? Am I right what I'm saying, though? Yeah, you were right. I mean, he, David said he lived in the guest house. I don't really know that that's the case. He said that his wife and him had separated and he moved to the guest house. And that's when I was dating him. Lo and behold, 
the truth was that his wife was pregnant and, you know, I don't know if he had been lying about the guest house the whole time or they had a fight. He moved out. And when she gave birth, he, she decided to take him back. I'm not really sure because I, I stopped speaking to him. But um, yeah, no, I've, de- I've definitely had a good a decent, interesting roster of people that I've yeah roster been on dates with or that I, you know, that I've been intimate with. But, you know, I don't discriminate, you know, all day. Anyone that I find to be um, interesting, gregarious, funny. And, you know, I'm attracted to people that when they walk in a room, everybody wants to know them, but they just want to be with me. I think that's really like intoxicating. You just described Tom Center. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's it. No doubt. You know, the, you, I can relate, Rachel. I just finished a, a huge book. And it's such a relief. Um, and I know you've got one coming out next year. It was a big story. I mean, your your lit agent is is one of the biggest in the world. There was a there was a huge bidding war for this book because it's it's being called a tell all. Have, have you started to write it? Or are you almost done? What's the process, and and what's going to be in the book? So, I, um, the book is very exciting to me because, as we've kind of discussed already in this podcast. There's so many other parts to my life that I find much more interesting that I think that people will find interesting if I could write about it and tell the details about it in one whole book and maybe figure out what happened in that in that story and why I got to that point that I became that person uh, and then how it's been ever since. But, you know, that story is not like what defines me, but it defines me to a lot of other people. Just like I think Kato, you would understand what I'm talking about. So it's nice to be able to write a book about that and let people know who you are. And if they decide to dislike me after reading that, that's fine because then they get the whole gamut of who I am. And, you know, I think that I have been misunderstood a long time. I'm, you know, I'm not somebody who is mostly disliked if you know me. So, um, so I like to have that opportunity. So yes, I'm working on the book. Um, I can't talk about the the process that we're in right now with the book, but, um, or who has it, but it, it is going to be a great book. I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, people that don't like you know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, when people that don't like you anywhere, I, I've gotten to the point in my life. It's like, okay, I grew up when I, when I was growing up in high school, it's like, I want everybody to love me, but you know what? Not everybody's going to love you. It's fine. And, and your attitude is just, it's just perfect. It's just like, I'm, I'm Rachel. I'm not going to change. This is who I am. Like me or don't like me. Well, you have a choice. And I know both of you and the haters are the people that haven't met you. Once you, once you meet Cato, it's impossible not to love them. I mean, it's impossible. Good luck with that. Rachel, same thing. I want people to get to know that you're a real person, that you've dealt with a lot of shit in your life, you know, and I think you've handled it amazingly. And, and, and it's interesting. I like a little spice, right? I mean, spice finds you. Do you ever feel that way that this stuff, there's certain people on this planet where stuff just finds them because of their personality, their dynamics, their charisma, the, their career, whatever it is. But would you agree with that? I mean, there's just certain people that are always going to be in the middle of it. Yeah. I mean, it's happened that way so far. So I think so. I mean, there are certain things that are a matter of, you know, um, you making them happen and getting involved in stuff from a choice. And then there's something that's just complete fate and it happens to you, like what happened with my father dying when I was young um, or, you know, uh, being in 9-11 the way I was or, um, you know, those are things that happened to me that I had to, you know, that I was affected by. But making choices and making the wrong choices and getting yourself in trouble um, is another route of it. But, yes, I have found um, interesting, spicy things in my life. And uh, I'm 40 now. I'm just rounding, you know, uh, I've just finished another decade where I kind of haven't had that many spicy things happen. I'm wondering if something weird's going to happen. Come <laughs> up. Um, right. Making any bad choices. I try not to make bad choices anymore, but we'll see if I'm in something. That, well, if, if something crazy happens, we'll hear about it on the podcast, I hope. Right. Or you call us if it's really scandalous. We'll help you broadcast it to the world. Yeah. Um, I hope you know, not I look scandalous anymore, but just, you know, interesting. 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 There we go. That's the key word. You know, the book I just did had to do with a huge scandal. And, and the person I was working with, it's painful for him, a lot of this stuff, because it was a really difficult time. And the stuff that he had to endure unfairly, I can't really talk about the details. I will in a few weeks, but it's one of the biggest scandals of the last 25 years. And it was difficult times for him. And I could totally understand that, having to relive some of this stuff that is painful. How about for yeah. you? Is it, is, it, is it a therapeutic process or has this been difficult having to write and and get these emotions and these feelings and these memories out of something that was kind of difficult. No, it, I mean, 
there are times when I get emotional. A lot of times when I'm writing stuff and I get emotional. So I actually know that that chapter is going to be good or that that part is good because I still feel it, you know? Um, I mean, I'm human. I still feel everything that I went through. And if I stop and think about it or I'm writing about it and rewriting it or or reading it, reading what I've written, you know, if it makes me emotional, then I know that I've got it, right? And if I just read through it and I and I have no emotion, then I feel like it hasn't come across well enough because all those things that I choose to write about were things that affected me. So, um, you know, I want them to be effective in the book to to let people know what it was like to go through that or how I became the next person from that or what people can do if they're in that situation to get out of trauma or, you know, shame or whatever those universal feelings are that everybody feels. Well, both you and Tom, I got these, these books are really major hits. And I just got a call from my agent and asked me if I would accept an advance from Harper Collins. And I said, I'm not gay, but he's cute. <laughs> I put that in there for Rachel again. You know, we'll pay you to read our books. How's that? I will we'll give you the day. Are, are there pictures? Can I color? <laughs> are there, is there a grant? No, you guys are, it's just, you know, it's great because Tom, your book's going to be a huge hit, a scandal. Rachel, I know your book, you've got, I just people are just going to want to yeah. the the celeb part about it just right there, and then your your life. It's just uh, it's the it's a perfect. It's well, it's like the perfect book, and you've got the podcast. The residual blowback is going to be amazing from that book. Your your podcast is going to be like one of the top ones in the world, and it's a good thing that you gave yourself about a, a year ramp up to just get really comfortable doing it, get into a flow. You're going to have producer or people calling you, I'm sure you already do, wanting to be on the show. And it's going to make your job that much easier. I want to go back to one thing, one thing that you had to endure in your life. And and and, and Cato, I, I think it can jump in on this as well. When the, when the whole scandal for you, Rachel, blew up, it was in, you were in Australia. And it was when National Enquirer, you know, reported on this for the first time. So what was it like flying back from Australia? Could you sense... Was it just very apparent that your life was different from that moment on? And were you flying back alone? Um, those are good questions. Um, those are things that I can't get into at the moment. But what, what I will say is where when people found out, I was, in the, I was back in New York and it was awful. I mean, it was awful. I was by myself. Um, I had been by myself. And uh, when the, the crash happened, and people started to figure out if there was a crash, there was a fight. If there was a fight, it must have been over something big. The National Enquirer story had come out three days before. Um, and so people, good journalists started putting that together. And paparazzi descended upon my house within, you know, five hours of people putting that together the day after Thanksgiving. So I had about 50 paparazzi outside of my house. My family wasn't talking to me. My friends weren't talking to me. And, you know... I, I was by myself. I had no idea what to do. It was awful, awful, awful. And everybody was commenting about it. And when the whole world has a comment about you and it's so awful and it's just totally, you know, you want to speak, but it's too big. It's too big of a story. Um, it just doesn't make a difference. It's just, it was really horrible. I mean, it really, my life completely changed as of that day. At that moment, what were you doing for work at that time? Are you, are you Tao in New York? Are you, what's going on in your life? I was working for another club that I had just opened called the Griffin. Um, and I you had, had to stop then. I had to quit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I quit immediately. I mean, I couldn't even go with, I mean, going to work would have been a total nightmare. Um, so yeah, I did not go back to work after okay. that. Yeah. Which makes it even worse because that could at least occupy your time, get your mind off it. Now you're home having to deal with it, trying to sneak out because the paparazzi is there day and night. You know, it, when, when the media decides that they want to churn a narrative, nothing can stop them. And, and, and they all they all do the same story. They all hammer it the exact same way. So it has to be a real you against the world feeling. You have to feel completely lonely, completely isolated. Who did you turn to at that point? Did you have family that you could? A lot of people could turn to God or their faith, uh, family, friends. What was it? Because, man, that's all day, every day with really you being completely misunderstood at the time? I mean, I honestly, I had nobody. So I really had to turn to myself. My mother wasn't speaking to me. She was like, you should change your name. Um, this is embarrassing. You know, she had a different last name than me because I have my father's last name. So she was just horrified and literally no one would talk to me. I had a few friends. I had this guy, Tim, who was one of my best friends at the time, who was away for Thanksgiving, but came back and 
help me kind of deal with what was going on. And we were photographed for a while together, just trying to go to the gym. Um, and, you know, but again, people thought he was my boyfriend or something. He's gay. He's my gay friend, you know, like just nobody knew what they were talking about. And it was just awful. And, uh, you know, I, I can honestly say I leaned on myself. That's when I like grew up. I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to do crisis management? Like I literally should have a crisis management company for people that go through this stuff. Cause I always laugh when you hear about a celebrities in trouble and they've hired a crisis person, like this woman, um, rock out for Vanderpump rules. And they're all talking about, oh, her crisis PR person says to do this, that, and the other thing. I could pretty much guarantee, unless it's she hired somebody who went through an actual crisis with the press personally, that person she hired has no idea what the hell they're talking about. Because you right. right. being advised by somebody who went through it and knew how to navigate that and figured it out. I figured it out. I got a lawyer. I you know, I figured it out, but there was so much going on that I could not handle. So I'm, I, you know, that's why it's very hard for me to date going forward because I feel like I'm my own catcher. Like I know how to get myself out of a parent dying, being in a scandal, being in a huge loss that the world went through like September 11th. No one got me out of it but me. And I never had someone's couch to live on um, or someone to cry to and be like, can you handle this for me? I would have loved that, but I never had that. The top, you, you, you're a tough person. That's great. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to do two questions uh, because I, I know you're super busy. Two questions. It's two-parter. First, your relationship with your mom, is it better or is it uh, still no talk with her? We talk, but I have a, I have a daughter. So we talk mostly, you know, because she likes to see my daughter. Um, so that's really all we talk about. We are not close. It, no. Okay. In Florida or New York? You say, because you're- She lives in New York. Your home base is Florida. Okay. Actually, she Other has a place. place in North and Florida, actually. And during this entire time of your celebrity of uh, working at Tao, and uh, that was like the, the Paris Hilton and uh, a lot of things going on, did you ever encounter O.J. Simpson? Um, no, I don't think I did. Um, what year did the trial happen? 94, oh, 95? Yeah, yeah, I was young. I wasn't there yet. So. Um, he, well, so I was in Vegas from 2005 to 2009 almost. So was he in jail then? I no, he was, he was running around Vegas at that time going out. I see him in Vegas. He was always in the Palms. That's where he was. As a matter of fact, I was, I was around OJ the weekend he got arrested for the memorabilia, literally. Because Fred was having a, a big birthday party in, at the Palms, at the Real World Suite, and he crashed it. OJ came there. He had a film crew following him around that he paid for. Right. That he paid for. He was going to get a reality show going. And that was the weekend that the whole thing went down with the armed robbery where, you know, he ended up going to prison for right. however how long. So he was running around there, but maybe not maybe yet not at the top. But that was that was that was the best time in Vegas. Those years, 2005, six, seven, eight, nine. Was that, that's what pool parties were starting to be so big. It was just electric. So that was the that was the, the highlight was in 2005. When it was at yeah, that's when we opened. Yeah. And it became the number one nightclub pretty much immediately. So uh, September 2005 is when we opened. But no, I never ran into OJ. But, you know, I I can imagine because of his personality and all that, he was well welcomed by people no matter what had happened to him because he has the star quality, right? So I think a lot of people, when they're around him, just forgive whenever anger they had at the time, right? Because they're like, oh my God, I'm around OJ and he's so famous. And they kind of put aside that he may or may not have killed somebody. So, or may or may not have been this jealous domestic violence guy. And um, yeah. I I can imagine that it's not, you know, if he came to the club, people would say, Rachel, you got to take care of him. You got to make sure he has whatever he wants. He gets calmed. And that would have been somebody I would have been like, why? Why are we doing this? <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't I, matter at the time. And I, I kind of wonder if that's how he gets, you know, how people react to him now. Well, I think that in front of me, I'd be like, well, did you, yeah, I mean, it, how can we not still looking for the woman? Like, I mean, or how could we not looking for the woman or man? The killer. Yeah. Who the killed, killer. yeah. Who killed them? Like, what is wrong with you? Why are you out golfing? Yeah. So. You'd really say that probably. That New York streets. Yeah. yeah, you would. You'd say that too, but you're used to dealing with 
celebrities all the time. I think it's part of the reason he's in Vegas because people lose their minds in Vegas. They, it's not normal. It's not real. So they, they, there's always a comfort level with people because they're drinking. Yeah. They're ha having a good time. Hey, it's OJ. Hey, can I get a photo? Blah, blah, blah. Tom, you're exactly right. So Rachel, I, what Tom just said is that that's kind of, did you, it, it was Vegas just like too much at one point? Like I'm, I'm out. No, never. I, cause when you live there, you really know how to contain like what you're doing. Like I, again, I was not drinking or doing drugs. And the only time I was like at a strip club is when I was bringing a client there. It's not, you know, I was very, I, you know, my life was, had a lot of boundaries and I was really good at living a very nice life and I wanted to keep it that way. So I didn't doubt we are. What's that, what was and the reason you got out? It. What was the reason you got out? Of um, I didn't really get out. They, I broke, Jason and I broke up and then he was starting a, but he wanted to create the element that Vegas had back in New York. So I went back to New York and worked as director of VIP operations to bring that, you know, expertise there to open up. They ended up opening up Stan Social and um, Avra and all these different places there. And so I would go and I would, you know, deal with the people that were at dinner and they would you know, call me when a celebrity was there. I'd come introduce myself. I'd get a car service for them and I'd bring them over to one of the clubs, Marquee or whatever, you know, clubs they were promoting at the right. time. So, you know, I was like the liaison for the celebrity. So it was still fun, but I, and then I went to work in the Hamptons for them as well when they opened up a club and got to do the same thing that I did at Vegas, which was running the front door, dealing with the bottle service customers, like dealing with the celebrities. It was so fun. I loved what it. The, yeah, high end people. Yeah, you know what? I, I just, amazing high end. I feel so bad you had such a boring life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I that's just tragic. Uh, by the way, nightlife scene, Vegas, New York, what's the key difference if you're thinking about it? If, if you were to describe it to an alien that just landed in your front yard, how would you describe the difference? Is it amateur hour in Vegas because people are coming there from all over or no. is it a little bit for an higher level in, in, in city in this in new york city it's much more about what you look like and who you know i remember when i was working in the hamptons they had a guy come work with me that had been in new york for years doing that job and we did not get along because my job was to make money for the owners and bring in you know i could charge a group of guys ten thousand dollars for a table and eight guys could come in if they were going to pay for it i don't care and then i would put a bachelorette party of girls next to him and it would kind of all even out. But the other guy at the door would literally, I'll never forget this, they're so awful. He put a scale at the front door and would have to all stand on it. And if they weren't oh, crazy, sure. then or not, oh, they did not get in it. It was so mean. And I, I was like, what the hell's wrong with you? He's like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, that's not how this works. Like we just, it, it was all about, first of all, we would have made no money for the, for the company. Um, and he would have just let in models who, by the way, at the end of the day, can be, not all, very boring. They're hungry. They have a sour look on their face. <laughs> They're not about to make a fool of themselves and get drunk and dance around and be fun, right? They're not having their best knives only, night only. They're like making a puckering face and trying to look pretty and cool. And it's like, those are fun girls. I want the girls in Vegas who are like, they don't have to be cute at all. And those are the girls that are up on the table dancing, kind of getting the hottest guy in the room because the guy's like, that girl has so much confidence. I want to be with her. I don't want to be with the sourpuss chick. Holy crap. So Vegas was- You just described my wife. <laughs> you just described my wife, Shonda. Literally to a T on a table in Vegas. Me off to the side. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, hey, I got one more for you, Rachel. Well, what's the next chapter going to be for you? What do you hope it's going to be? I mean, because it's going to be high profile. The book's going to gonna be big. It's going to be a big media tour, book signings. It's going to bring- huge exposure to your podcast. What, what, what are you looking forward to in the next next chapter of your life? In the next chapter, I mean, I'm really focusing on the podcast right now. So I'm not even looking at how the book's going to turn out. That's like two steps ahead for me because it's not, it's just not here yet. What I'm like in the middle of right now is doing my podcast. And I'm just hoping we get to this 90 day mark. We see how well we're doing. I'd like to take that somewhere, right? I'd, I'd like to be able to take that to a company, you know, I'm doing it all by myself, as a matter of fact. So like, I, I want to be able to make the podcast bigger, whether or not it turns into a show or, you know, a, a bigger podcast or, you know, re really have people know about it. So it, that would be really fun to me for, for me. That's what I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to moving to Florida, being a Floridian and, um, you know, just making my mark there kind of. So I, I think of what's going on in the now, not too, too far in advance. Are you approached a lot of times? I don't, I don't think you're, you're not a wife now, you're single, you said, but do you approach other shows like uh, Housewives of New York or is this, a, are reality shows after you? 
I imagine uh, that I, ha- I have been approached by Real Housewives of New York. That was years ago. I believe that Leah, the girl Leah, who got the part, was the one who kind of beat me out or whatever. I didn't. I was auditions. Part. I didn't know that. Probably now they do for sure. I didn't know they had auditions for that. I, that's, they just would like. Yeah, well, they called me and they said, you'll be, you're at the point where you're like the top five. I have, I didn't even know who they had interviewed. And a lot of people submit, you know, their tape or whatever, however they do sure. it. Sure. And um, no, they're they, trying to get on. Yeah. And they called me. I didn't want to be on. And I didn't pay that too much attention. I did like a Zoom call with the head casting person and I had to send in some stupid videotape. I just like gone out of the shower. I didn't really have any makeup. Like I looked, it, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. And, you know, they probably wanted somebody that was like a little more done and feisty and whatever. But my thing for them is like, listen, I don't know who you're casting, but I'm a real New Yorker. I've basically grown up here. I went to private school here. I have lived here forever. I went through September 11th and I was a public person for that. And I'm a New Yorker. Like, so anyone else that's trying to be a New Yorker um, is not right for you. So like- I'm no kidding. And you'd be so bored with those people, you'd see right through them, man. You'd destroy those people. Oh my God. I'd be like, what? You would spit them out. I can't believe they would pass out. No, but- but, here's but I think it's a smart move. You didn't do it. Yeah, but here's a little known fact about Rachel. One of the highest paid reality stars of all time, right? I mean, from your yeah. stint with Dr. Drew on Celebrity Rehab. I mean, yeah. come on, man. You're, you're I'm not sure that I'm a it, show. But, um, so, I, I was the most paid reality star for doing like a, you know, a, a thing like that. At the time, it was on VH1. They paid me $400,000 to be on Celebrity Rehab, which was part of why I did it. Because at the time I was being offered um, a... The Apprentice by Donald Trump, and that's favored nations, and you only get twenty five thousand. But I was actually very nervous about how they would um, represent me on on um, mm-hmm. the, the Apprentice. So I decided to do Celebrity Rehab. But the money helped, but that was not why I chose it. Ultimately, I chose it because I met with Dr. Drew, and he was so amazing. And I had become such a recluse by that time from being in the news so much, I, I really had no one to connect with. And as I said, I felt really alone. And when I met him the day before we started filming, I had no intention of saying yes, but I met him and I was like, I need you. I don't have anyone. I'm at rock. Wow. Bottom. That's really cool. I've done yeah, never worked. It was the best, by the way, it was the uh, best experience. I loved it. Yeah. I, I, I've done a show many times, not that, that show, but, and at my ignorance, I didn't see the show, but what was your addiction? Love addiction. As I said, I'm not a I'm not an addict, so I hesitated to go on the show also because I thought that is so dumb. I'm not going to do a show and call myself a love addict. That's just stupid. Right. Well, especially when other people are on there like detoxing from heroin and like all this crazy stuff. Also, I didn't feel like a celebrity, so I was like, "How can I go in this show? This is so embarrassing." But I will say it was one of the best things I ever did. The show was not scripted. People are always like, oh, you should oh, go on reality TV because great. you look so dumb. If you're dumb and you say stupid things and you don't act like yourself, right. they're going to represent you exactly how you act. But you're I getting was, it exposed. Got it. Yeah. I was true to myself. I literally only talked about my loss from September 11th, losing my father from a cocaine overdose when I was younger and how that's affected my relationship with men and myself going forward. And I realized I was a love addict. And so I ended up going on tour with Dr. Drew after a little bit and talking about love addiction and people still contact me once in a while to work with rehabs about love addiction. So I'm on board for that. I thought it was so dumb. If you're going to have an, if you're going to have an addiction, love addiction is probably the best one to have. Yeah. You go back and watch the last episode, Kato. Uh, Dr. Drew comes over to you. You might as well face it. You're addicted to love. You say that? No, I don't think so. Hey, by the way, could you imagine the negotiations that Dr. Drew's agent or no, producer comes up to Rachel and says, hey, we're going to offer you 90000 she goes, I make tips bigger than that. What else you got? <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened. They offered me 70. Then they offered me 120. And I was like, who do you think you're talking to? Like, that's not, that's just dumb. I'm, I'm the biggest name in news right now. And I don't have an addiction. I don't want to go on this stupid show. This is horrible. So then, you know, they kept cutting 200, 250. And I was like, no, but I'll do it for 400. And I was just joking. And they said, yes. And and you you did this yourself? You wrapped your... No, group. I I had a manager. He thought I was totally nuts when I said the number. He was like, yeah. "Not, we're not asking for that." I'm like, "Well, then I'm not." Totally love it That's until he got his commission. And that was going to be yeah, it was massive. That's love great. it. Right. Well, uh, Rachel, you're more than kind to give us this much time because I know that you uh, 
had laryngitis, but yeah. I never uh, no, there are listeners. No, I don't, not, I don't I'm like an old man, but we know I wanted we don't, to do by it. The way. Nope. You I thank you so much. Yeah, Rachel, and, thank you. It was great. It was awesome. Part two next week. We're gonna go oh. three hours with you next time. Just kidding. Hey, continued success. It's awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna introduce you a couple people. Maybe can help as you elevate the podcast. I think there's a couple options for you, but uh, keep it rolling. And uh, we're pulling for you and we really appreciate it. All right. Thank that would be so great. Much. I would appreciate that. Yeah. I hope that your listeners to this will go on my podcast and listen to me at Misunderstood with Rachel. You could tell it's on Spotify, Apple, anywhere you hear your podcast. So and you should definitely listen to the Keto Kaylin episode. Bye. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, please. Uh, I endorse. In, do you endorse me? I endorse you. You're fantastic. Yep. So Go download and subscribe it right now. Rachel uh, Ucatel's podcast, Misunderstood with Rachel Ucatel. All right. Enjoy the weekend. I hope you got some good plans. Have some fun. Okay? Thank you so much, John. Thanks for coming to you. All right. That was better. Well, I knew it was going to be great. Okay. Because she yep. is just so revealing. She's so honest. She's so raw. And now she can talk. Yes. Right. There's been a time where she couldn't really say anything. If you watch the, the, the documentary on, on HBO, which was unbelievable a few years ago about, about Tiger Woods, the two parter, Rachel was the star of part two. And that was really the first time that she was able to, to, um, you know, go out there again, go in front of a camera and talk a little bit about it. I think she had just had enough at that point and said, I'm going to do this. Probably had a little bit of blowback from that, but man, she's fantastic. Well, I think the, the part that was the greatest because I have done her show. So there was a, it's just the, the, it was so comfortable for her. It was comfortable, comfortable for me. So it was like two friends talking or three friends with yeah. included. So I think that's, that's the, uh, the, the key. And it was just, you know, compelling. She mm -hmm. just, she really opened up. Yeah. And I was, I was with Rachel. I helped her get her podcast started. Wow. So, um, I know a lot about it. Um, and I, and I think I, I think I have a few people I do want to introduce you to, but what were you, what were you guys? Um, cause I'm going to go back and listen to it. And I want everybody to go back and listen to Cato's episode on Rachel's podcast, but give us a little tease. What was it? Was, how, how did she delve into, you know, what, what you experienced well, she, in your life? She, she talks a lot about, you know, uh, my feelings about where I was uh, during the, the Bronco chase. Uh, some of the questions that have been uh, asked of me before, but the thing is that Rachel and I related to each other because we were both maligned in the, uh, the media made us, uh, you know, they made me a pariah or, you know, an assassin's target, whatever. They didn't say the good things and kind of the same for her. So we immediately had a connection with, um, Mm -hmm. Hey, I've been through this. You've been through this. And it just made it uh, comfortable. And there's a handful of people on the whole yeah. planet that have experienced what you two have. I hope you guys stay in touch because you guys should be friends. Yeah. You know, you'd be one of the people that if she ever did go through something like that again, you could call her. Right now that you have a relationship, I think it would be very big for her, right? Comforting. Yeah. Knowing that there's somebody out there as a true friend that, talk, that can understand. Talk to Shang-Yi about this first. Good point. <laughs> you better, you better have, you better. <laughs> you might want to have an NDA sign there. Ah. <laughs> All right. Hey, awesome podcast episode. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you download and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the like button. Just do whatever you have to do. Tell yeah. your friends. Share this thing. I mean, that, that's amazing stuff that we got from Rachel. That was an awesome our episode. Are, our shows are fantastic. All right. And more to come, too, as uh, as the summer. We got a lot to talk about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal details about this book I've been teasing. I, I'm going to be able to talk about it soon. It's, it is, it's involving one of the biggest scandals of the past 25 years. One of the biggest media stories by far. I can't wait to share the details of what this book is all about. And yeah, Kato, we, we want The audience wants you to share. I'm going to. And it's just comments. a couple more weeks. So yeah, stay with me. Share. And I'm going to tell you everything everything about it and we're actually going to bring on the person that was in the middle of it onto the show and it's big and tell your friends please one degree of scandalous on youtube like tom said hit like but uh, also hit sub subscription yep. it helps us out and be great and we're going to tell you more about wrong place wrong time coming up soon coming, coming up, up soon. soon all right and then uh Kato, you got a big week next week we'll talk about it after the fact got it okay next friday thanks everybody for watching for the man Cato kaylin i'm tom zenner i think stock Tip Dave is back there somewhere. We can't see him with the monitor. But thanks so much for joining us. One Degree of Scandalous with Cato Kalen and Tom Zen. Bye. Bye.